Varsha tu hi eka chokma. Kanakra kat vins medina. Aye kanak chochenu aloni. Akoi mak warep tak manema kiswi. Kiswarshe kinan aye kiswarshe kinan makam nomo. Yarute mak holshe warep tak ne marute ne tuhi. In my Chochenyo Ohlone language, what I said is good evening and um, welcome to our land. My name is Vince Medina. I am Ohlone, I'm Chochenyo Ohlone. I'm a member of the Muekma Ohlone tribe of the East Bay. And I am, tonight it's supposed to be a wonderful night full of, of beauty and strong words. Due to the wonderful rain that we're having, which we can't complain about it because it's great that we're having this, right? Um, some of our speakers might be running a little bit late, but I figured that it's better that we start um, to share some songs, to share words, and to share this immense beauty of native California. This is a spoken word event. It's an open mic event. There's, um, there's no agenda that's part of this. And the reason why I wanted to have this event as an open mic is because it represents the dynamic beauty, the enduring beauty that's here in California. Historically in California, there's 120 different languages that are spoken just within the modern boundaries of what we call California. Today, 60 of these languages are spoken today and many more are being relearned and revitalized, including my family's language, Chochenyo. Chochenyo is the language of the East Bay. So the language of, if you think Richmond, Berkeley, Oakland, all the way down to about San Jose. And it's a very close, close, close sister to Ramatush, which is the native language of San Francisco. Historically, there's about eight different Ohlone languages that are spoken in this area that stretches from San Francisco, Vallejo, all the way down to about Monterey. And today, three of these Ohlone languages are being relearned and, re and um, re reawakened. Chochenyo, which is my community's language. Rumsin, which is the Monterey Ohlone language. And we're fortunate to have um, Greg Castro, who is, who, who is Rumsin Ohlone here tonight, and Mutsin, which is the language of the area near Gilroy. Um, I'm proud that these languages are coming back and that they're being reawakened. And to give a bit of an overview about who I am and my connection to language and my passion for language. So um, I am Ohlone. I am East Bay Ohlone, we're, we're the native people of this area. And for about 70 years, our language was said to be extinct. It was said to be, um, to be dead, to be lost to time. It was as a result of things like the missions, missionization. The Spanish, when they came here with uh, missions, they, um, they, they forced us not to speak our languages. During the secularization period in the Mexican ranchos, um, communities became sometimes disconnected and people didn't have others to speak to. And during the worst time for us, which is the gold rush genocide, people would often be killed if they spoke their languages. And it was a horrible and terrifying time to be Indian. But somehow out of those, those horrible atrocities that occurred, and we know that history can be very unfair Somehow our languages persevered and our cultures persevered, our identities persevered, our stories, our dances, our religions, all of these things that many thought would at one point be silenced kept going and they're still here today. And I avoid this mantra that, that's often all throughout the California Indian world that just says we are still here because we're more than just still here, we're thriving and we're doing very well. We're doing very well in reclaiming things that were taken from us. We're doing very well in, re, in reinventing and, re, um, and, and adapting to changes. And the words that you're here that you'll hear tonight are words that, that are connected. And these are the oldest words of this area that today we call the Bay Area. So for thousands of years before this land heard anything else, before the land heard Spanish or English or any other language, it heard the native words that are going to be spoken tonight. And 
I thoroughly believe in my heart that language also has healing capacities. It heals. And when the land hears the words and the words come back to life and the words are reawakened, then what happens is the land, it hears something that, that, that it's heard for a very long time that must be very comforting. And with that, there's spiritual capacities that are connected to the language. So people will ask, well, if all of these, these um, difficult challenges occurred, and if the language stopped being spoken for 70 years, how are you able to speak it today? And that's a realistic question. That's a fair question to ask. And the reality is that we had to relearn it. We had to reconnect with it. And what happened is after the missions that I was describing, after the gold rush genocide, after all these atrocities, the language kept being spoken, but only by a handful of people. So Rumsen, uh, Mutsen, and Chochenyo all had just handfuls of people that were speaking the language. Just a couple, three or four maybe, that's it. And could you imagine, just you know, think about this, what a terrifying time it must have been to be what could be the very last of a language that goes back thousands of years. It must have been absolutely terrifying. But despite that terror, despite that unknown world that was in front of them, they kept speaking. And one of the, the elders in our community, his name is Jose Guzman. He's one of our ancestors. He's Ohlone, he's East Bay Ohlone. When he was asked about the language, and when he was documenting the language, he said, Kana akwe tak yuwa tak nanwente, which means, as for me, I am not going to stop speaking. So we have an obligation, I believe, as modern day Indian people, as the indigenous people of this land, we have a unique obligation to continue the language and to continue on, even if we're entering uncertain times. And even if we're entering times that we don't know, you know, because who knows? Maybe all of this work that we're doing right now, maybe in 50 years, nobody will care about it anymore. That could be a reality. But we face those challenges and we keep going because we know we have an obligation to walk in the footsteps of those giants before us who refuse to stop speaking the language. And these people, what they did was they recorded thousands of pages of notes of documentation of their language with linguists that came throughout the Bay Area. And in my community, there was a linguist named John Peabody Harrington who um, recorded um, many Ohlone languages. He recorded Chochenyo, he recorded Rumson, he recorded Mutsin Ohlone languages, and also many Chumash languages as well. And he recorded these languages, and many people see him as being a hero, and he is a hero in his own right, but the heroes to me are those people who gave the information and who sat down with Harrington who recorded their words, who recorded their stories, and they recorded also their songs on wax cylinder recordings. And we're talking songs that are sung about Mount Diablo, songs that are sung about Mission Peak. There's um, stories that go back into the beginnings of the world when all of the world was flooded, except the very peak of Mount Diablo, which in our language we call Tushtak, which means the place of the day. But after Indians escaped the missions, the Spanish called it the thicket of the devil. So Mount Diablo is where we get the name today. Uh, I like our name better. That's just to be said, though. Um, they told these stories of a time when giants roamed the world, when stone bodies were being defeated in the underworld. When, and they told these stories as if they happened yesterday. There was just immediacy to recording these stories. And I think of these people who recorded these stories and these, these, um, these, these tales, these legends, I think of these people as being my heroes, like my martyrs, because they weren't going out without a fight. They, they weren't going out without at least trying to save their language. And they succeeded because we're able to speak it today. We came together as a community, my tribal community, um, and many other tribal communities in California. And we started to reawaken the words. So to relearn them from the old documentation that exists, 
from wax cylinder recordings by listening to their words, by listening to their pronunciation, by listening to their grammatical structures. And what I started to realize, and I, I, many other people in our community as well, is that when we reawaken the words, we peer into this world of complexity and of beauty. Because when a lot of people say, oh, you can learn about the past through archeology. span You can learn about the past through accounts of what people wrote in the Spanish. You can learn about the past through this way or through that way. And there's, there's truth to that. I suppose you can. But what you can't learn through archeology span or through the accounts of the Spanish or through um, the accounts of Gold Rush, you know, people coming in and, and writing about Indians, is you can't peer into the soul of how a people saw themselves, but with language you can. And there's a lot of negative things that are, that are out there about Indian people, especially Indian people in California. Things that are instilled in our minds through fourth grade curriculums of having to build horrible mission projects of having to go and, and read about these minimalistic people who collected acorns and just kind of seem to disappear. That's often what's presented of us. The reality, though, is far more complex. And when we look into the language, we see the complexity, we see the beauty, we see the way that people interacted, we see the way that people um, came together. And that in itself shatters all stereotypes that are out there. And so when I say language can heal, this is one thing that I would like to discuss and maybe put the seeds in your mind, that language does heal because it empowers us with, with our confidence, it raises our self-esteem, and it connects us to the oldest words and the oldest people of this land. And those people are still here. They're still, they're still here physically, they're still here spiritually, and in Chochenya, we have a phrase, and the phrase is makwarep takhenwep erek, nuhu ayer nihimu makpuyashik maisha. And it means the ground turned to stone, but below and above, the world of the spirit remains. And it's important to think about this, because if you look around at a place like San Francisco, it physically is stone, it's concrete, right? Look around, you don't see much existence of Indian culture. You don't see much of the thousands of years of existence of Indian people in this area. It's, I mean, it's really hard, you know, to even notice that we even are here. But as long as we're here, we are in itself, we, we go against the, the stereotypes, we shatter the stereotypes and we delegitimize the fact that other people own this land that really can't be owned because the land is alive and it's a part of us and it's connected to our DNA, to our blood, it's connected to everything that makes us Ohlone today, everything that makes us indigenous. So I wanted to do two things um, and then I'm going to open up the mic to my fellow um, native Californians who are here to sing or to share words or to offer blessings, offer prayers, whatever they would like. We live in a modern world, so we do have time limits. Um, 7.30 is the time that they told us um, that we should be done. So I'll try to my best to keep this on time. But I would just like you to think, as you're hearing these words, you know, maybe put yourself somewhere else and just think that these are the oldest words of this area, of our home. This is our home. And we, we have a right to speak this language. We have a right to speak our words. And when we do, we bring them back to this place that they've been in since the beginning of time. I'm gonna say a prayer, and during this prayer, I would ask you to stand. Um, Okay, I'll tell you in Chochenyo, and then I'll repeat it into English. So, Kishkanak roket ashlip, waka in a hekshe. Waka in a hekshe, Kishkanak roket ashlip. Truhi ichan, aye makin mak isha, 
makin mak hem men yan. Ahukashe waka ene hekshe. Waka ene hekshe emrashu ahukashe. Emrashu ahukashe emrashu ahukashe. Ekmichish ima kish kanakrokat ashlip ya in sushta nikma. Mak itra nikma kish kanakrokat ashlip ya ishtu sinikma. Mak mere hishmen hiswani mak. Wake in a hekshe kish kanak rocket ashlip em okwe makish. Ya nu nu in sushte makish. Aye ya in sushte makish. Theta tohi haya at ne tohi akwe arukush. Theta tohi makin makhaya makmuekma. Theta tohi makin makhaya maknonokma maknonoi. Theta tuhi makin makhaya ta okwe makish. Theta tuhi at ne tuhi akwe arukush. Aye hushish tak makin makaltasen. Makin mak nonwente makhoshe nonokma. Makin mak okwe makhoshe muakma. Aye hushish tak piero ketoshe. Roke torshe, pie horshe, pie horshe, pie roke torshe, hushishtak. Oh. So you're welcome to sit down if you like. In our language, it means to you, Creator, I'm grateful for. Oh, sorry. To, um, I'm trying to think of the literal words because I've realized what I end up doing is I think more in Chochenyo sometimes than in English, which is not a bad thing, right? Um, but our word for creator is waka and hekse. And waka and hekse, what it means is the one who commands, the one who controls. And I said, I'm grateful to you, creator. Creator, to you, I'm grateful. It's a new day, and we are all here together. I ask you, Creator, to listen to me. I ask you to listen to me. To my ancestors, to our, our loved ones who passed, I'm grateful for your strength and your power. To our elders, the old timers, I'm grateful for your wisdom and for your dignity. For the generation that will come, for your dreams yet to be, for the sun that rises, for giving us a new day, for birthing us, and to you, Creator, for healing us, for your healing capacities. And we learn from our ancestors where they teach us every day. And every day can be a struggle or a fight, but every day we keep going, and every day we fight for our languages, and every day we fight for our people, and every day it might seem difficult, but we, the translation is we tread on, we keep going. So we speak our languages, and we cure our people, and because of this, tomorrow will be better, and we know it will be better, because it, it always gets better, and so on. So that's, that's a prayer I couldn't have said earlier in my life. Um, but I know that we're being guided by people outside of us. Um, we're being guided by our ancestors, I thoroughly believe. So I have been talking a lot. And um, there's, other, there's other Ohlone's and other Native people in the room who have a right to talk. And, um, and I want people to be able to share their words. Um, my friend Canyon Sayers Roots is here, and she's Mutsin Ohlone from, from um, the area near San Juan Batista. Greg Castro is here, and he's um, Rumsin Ohlone in, in Selenon. Um, uh, and then also Carly Dominguez. Where's Carly at? She's back there. And so Carly is Chumash. They're our relatives from down south in um, 
the Santa Barbara area. And if there are any other California native people who wanted to share words in their language, you're welcome to. It's an open mic. Um, and I'll try to, I'm a very poor MC, but I'll try to do my job to rotate people up. And then also I wanted to share a Chochenyo um, Ohlone story. So if I could start perhaps by asking um, Greg to come and share some words. I hate podiums, because then somebody might say, Greg was up making a speech last night. God forbid that anybody t said I made a speech. Um, I like talking to people. Um, might be hard to imagine that for some of you that know me that uh, at one point I was so shy I could barely talk to myself in the mirror. Mishistu is uh, our young and uh, very forceful and talented friend, Vince said. I'm uh, Greg Castro. I'm Totrasalin in Rumson Loney. And on my mother's side, uh, my Rumson uh, homeland is Carmel Valley, uh, mostly around the village of Tukutna, which is uh, sort of a bare patch of ground next to the creek nowadays. Um, so what li lives of our people is uh, right here. Imagine people that believe they came up for right, right from the ground, right? Many of our native stories in California talk about we're made from the things of our earth. Uh, my mentor, who was Pitt River, uh, believed that the, his people came from a, a berry bush. Um, my Slinen people thought we came from elderberry. These. So that dynamic is repeated in most of the cultures in California, and having that connection to where you're from, just think about that, and having it exist for thousands of years. And the language came from that. We came right up from the ground, and we were kind of staring around, and we had to describe to each other what we were seeing, what we were feeling, what we were experiencing, and that's where language came from. It came from the very place that we came from. So they're all intimately tied the language, the place we came from, and us. And the language doesn't really exist apart from us. But as Vin said, for, for many of the communities, it, it went to sleep. And uh, we're now uh, reawakening it um, slowly, carefully, uh, some more than others. Um, I really admire those like Vince and uh, Canyon who have committed themselves uh, and so much of their time to learning language, I have not. I have other things that I'm doing, uh, protecting the cul uh, cultural sites and, and other endeavors, so I've only learned a spattering over languages, uh, both uh, Rumson and, and Selenin. Uh, what I have learned, though, is a couple of languages from my cousin, Linda. So I'm going to do one now. Just real quick. Um, we do have a time limit, so I won't do the original version, which lasted about four or five days, probably. Not sure if we have enough coffee for that. So it'll just be a few, just a couple little snippets. Arapa sehoan wasiaheim. Arapa sehoan. Wasia heim, Arapa sehoan, 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 Wasia heim. Arapa Sihuan Wasihim. Um, that's one of my favorites. Um, 
it's not because it's the easiest. Actually, I worked on that one because it, I, I don't know. I told my cousin Linda, I said, some of the words, they sound Jewish to me. I, the, the, the pronunciation is just, and I'm not Jewish, so I don't know where that came from either, but it just sounds what I've heard uh, Jewish words pronounced. It sounds sort of like that, but it's Rumson. And uh, it, is, it is very tied to our, our area. Um, it is the Fog Song. And those of you in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area would know about fog. And just like San Francisco, Monterey has fog. And sometimes we just want it to go away. It's done its job. It's brought moisture to the plants and animals. And OK, you're done. Uh, you need to go home. Sometimes it doesn't listen. So you have to encourage it. Um, that song has to be repeated sometimes many, many times before the fog finally gets the message and goes home. My understanding of the translation for that, this shows you how connected we are with our land, how, what an intimate, personal connection we have. It's telling fog, you need to go home. Pelican is beating your wife. Our ancestors had a sense of humor. When I was much younger, and I first came out uh, of my tribal community and was doing work with other communities, um, I have to admit that I was um, amazed, even though I knew Indians weren't dead, right? Because I went to school, they said the Indians were dead, and I went home and told my dad. They said, we're all dead. And he said, that's OK, son, because then they won't try to kill you. Um, but it was still amazing that there was other native people. And unlike us, in either my Rumson side, the last speaker was probably in the 1920s, maybe in 1930, and the Slenin side, 1964, a little, little later, because they're much more rural, they managed to hide better for a little bit longer. But the last one passed on in about 1964 that we know of. And then nobody spoke it. My dad doesn't remember many words being said in his language from his grandparents who raised him. And so it was a revelation to me to hear native people speak their language. I knew there was native people, but they actually spoke their language, practiced their customs, did their traditional ceremonies. Obviously, I didn't get that from our public school program, that information. And hearing it directly from the people uh, was amazing to me. And the first one I remember was at Canyon's place in Indian Canyon, the first storytelling festival, way back in the early 90s when Canyon was very small. And the first speaker was a, a well-known basket weaver. Her name is Nancy Richardson Steele. She's Kuduk. And she got up. And I think some people thought it was a little rude because she started talking and nobody could understand what she was saying. And she kept going because they figured after a point she would stop and like do the translation thing, right? And she didn't. She probably talked for about 40 minutes and told about five, four or five or origin stories all in the Kuduk language. And myself, just like everybody else, I didn't understand a single thing she was saying. But to my ears, it was like a song. It was magical. The, it was a lyrical flow to it. And she did gestures, and so you kind of got the idea that it had something to do with frog women, which is one of their origin stories. But just the fact that you're hearing this in that magical place of Indian Canyon, ancient on its own, and hearing this ancient language, and that there are still speakers out there. And I'm not a hopeful kind of guy in general. I'm pretty pragmatic. And if I look around and I know enough of my history to know just what we've been through, but that gave me hope. And I still have hope, especially with these young people here uh, that you're going to hear tonight, um, that they've brought back the language. There's others within the Ohlone community that are virtually conversational. Now imagine that. It's been three quarters of a century or more since we've had speakers, 
and we have people hold, having conversations. That That is uh, a story in itself, I think, that's going to be told in a couple of centuries. Let me see if I can remember one more song. I decided not to tell any stories. I tell mostly Sillanen stories. Um, and we'll stick for that for the moment, unless I can't stretch out enough and we need some, kill some time at the end. But when Indians get the mic, that's usually not a problem. A keen a watten, a torch, a keen a watten, a torch, a keen a watten, a torch, a a keen a watten, a torch, 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 a keen a watten, a torch. That was a dear song. Where are we at? One little quick story. It's a very ancient story, about a month old. We were at the uh, Heyday celebration. Heyday Books had their 40th anniversary celebration a couple weeks ago, and there was about 500 people, which is pretty amazing because I heard there was only 250 tickets available. Um, so I don't know who crashed or who slipped under the wire or who knew who. Um, but there was a lot of people there uh, celebrating uh, this marvelous publication that has done a lot for Native people. Uh, our young MC Vince works there, lucky guy. Um, and one of the things that was really neat is Vince set up a gambling table, right? So I'm watching him gamble. I think when I walked up, he wasn't doing that well. And so he called out for a song, right? We were starting to talk about, we're gonna, we need a song, right? Um, I've just been trying to think of the song. I can't think of it because we're not gambling. See, we need to have the stakes out here. Uh, but I, at that moment, I did think of a gambling song. Um, and it worked while I sang it, I think. I don't know. Did you wind up winning? You won 40 bucks. I didn't get any of that. <laughs> Um, but that shows the power of our songs sometimes, right? Oh. Oh, guys, now you're going to make me sing it. Yeah, this is a gambling song. He away a walla willa, a he away a walla willa, a he away a walla willa. Oh, why you two, a why you two, a walla willa, a why you two, a why you two, a walla willa, a he away 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 a walla willa. Oh, why you two, a why you two, a walla willa. A why you two a why you two a walla willa a he away 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 a walla willa a why you two a why you two a walla willa a why you two a why you two a walla willa. So you can all go out and buy a lot of tickets. Hopefully you'll share a little bit of it, okay? <laughs> it went into the pot. Didn't it go into? It didn't go into your pocket, did it? To to arrange this, okay? You're covered. Some Indians are really fast. Um. 
I may look stunned here, it's because I was, because I was only asked to do this a couple of minutes ago. I didn't know it was an open mic. Um, good thing I, it's uh, half clapper will travel. I always keep it with me, never thinking I'd actually use it. In fact, usually it's when I don't have it that they usually get asked. Didn't work this time, but um, I'm just happy to share a little bit uh, of what I know of the Rumson uh, culture. Um, the final thing I wanted to say of that message of hope, um, the last month I've been doing a lot of conferences and symposiums and panels, and a lot of them had to do with what happened to us, and not necessarily the good part, the not the 15,000 years of history, it's just the last 150 or 200 years of history. And uh, that was a heavy weight. Um, some of the stories are really horrific, and it's probably a good thing in some ways our school system didn't tell you these things because they can give you nightmares. And this is things that humans did to other humans. Um, and I'm facing it now because tomorrow I'm actually going to go into a classroom and talk to a fourth grade class. Hopefully they don't have popsicle stick missions staring at me. But the good thing is that there's hope. We lost more than 90% of our people. So those of us that are here and they claim our connection to our ancestors came from that rugged and brave 10%. So I thank you for honoring them by your presence and listening to our words. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, Greg Castro, he's, he's always um, been a role model to me. And he lives up to his words by protecting our sites, by, by, by protecting culture. And Greg and I, before we've had this conversation, where us as a younger generation, we're able to continue on you know, so much knowledge and all of this because of the elders in our community. We couldn't have done it without elders who passed on and who kept that language and kept that knowledge, even if they didn't speak the language. My grandfather didn't speak Chochenyo. My grandmother didn't speak Chochenyo, but they kept that core of what it meant to be Indian alive, what it meant to be indigenous to this land alive. And, um, and recently what I've been doing, and before I pass on the mic to Canyon, is, um, I've been um, hosting language classes where we come together at, in, in my family, and we come together at this place called the Ohlone Cemetery, which is in Fremont, close to Mission San Jose. And we've been having community-based language classes there that started small, and they became something that, that is bigger than I thought that, that it might have at first. And the special thing about the Ohlone Cemetery is the continuity of our family that, that's, that's always used that place. It's an old, ancient village site. So it's about 40 miles to the south of here. It's an old, ancient village site that's been used for thousands of years. But then um, we've always continuously used it. And back in the 1960s, um, Caltrans wanted to put a freeway through the middle of it. And a bunch of our elders came together in the 1960s, and they said, no. They said, you're not going to do this to us. And some of the elders, they said, my mother's buried there. You know, it's not just an ancient Indian village site, but it's a place that we use, and, and our relatives are there. So we came together, and um, my grandfather's grandmother is buried there. Her mother is buried there, and her grandfather is buried there. And he was born in a time before there were any whites or Europeans in this area. So it shows, and we just we just buried a loved one there last year. So we, all, we always used it. So when we have community-based language classes, having that continuity to culture is so important because it shows that language, lineage, culture, ancestry, 
you know, all those things are just all part of one. There's no separation between them. And a lot of what we were doing when we came together at the Ohlone Cemetery in our last class was we were playing gambling games, like like what Greg was just talking about. We were playing staves, which is this really fun California Indian gambling game where you get a bunch of um, dice and you throw them down and then um, you get points and you have to like win as many, you have to win all the counting sticks in order to win the game. So it gets like people taunt one another and it can be like, you know, pretty like cutthroat and people bet money and people get really serious about this game. And we came together at the Ohlone Cemetery and we were, um, we were playing staves at our last language class as a basis to learn numbers and to count and to just have fun. We were, so we were going through the numbers, you know, with Imhen, Utin, Kapan, Katwash, Mishord, Shakin, Oshatish, Kanektish, Telektish, Shiwesh. We're repeating them over and over. And then one of the, one of the kids, she was about nine years old. She said, why don't, we, why don't we have any gambling songs that we sing? Why don't we sing any of them? And then one of the elders said, because all of our songs that we have for Chochenyo people, they're all religious songs, and it would be inappropriate to sing them. So they knew that we can't sing those songs. But then she said, this, this elder, she said, why don't you guys make some new Chochenyo gambling songs? And so we did. So we started to come together, and we made some new gambling songs that are in Chochenyo. Um, and I can't remember all of them, but there's one. And our songs are kind of short. Um, all of all, many California Indian songs are just based on a lot of repetition. So, um, but it's but they're beautiful. So one of them goes something like, um, let me see, how does it go? This is new. So, it's. Akaya eknesha, akaya eknesha. Hemen rekaya senek, akaya eknesha. Akaya eknesha, akaya eknesha. Hemen rekaya senek, akaya eknesha. Akaya eknesha, akaya eknesha. Hemen rekaya senek, akaya eknesha. Akaya eknesha, akaya eknesha. Hemen rekaya senek, akaya eknesha. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it means, it means, oh, I'm going to win. I'm going to win. All your money out there, I'm going to win. Now I'm going to win it all. <laughs> So um, it shows even if things might seem like they're lost, they can come back, you know, um, they can come back. So next up, um, I want to invite my good friend Canyon um, to share her words. All right. My name is Canyon Sayers Roots. I am the daughter of Anne Marie Sayers. We reside in Indian Canyon, the only federally recognized Indian country between Sonoma and Santa Barbara. And that has always been my home. I am oh so very lucky to have the family and relations that I have that now because I have grown up knowing I am native my entire life. As a young one, my mom loves to tell the story. I was about five, six years old, I went to school and I had told someone I was Native, I was, I was a Native American and they're like, you say you're Indian, you're all dead. I went home crying. My mom brought me to school the next day and I go and point him out, I'm like, it's him, it's him, he did it, he said it. And he's going into the young boys bathroom and my mom's like, what am I supposed to do? She ended up speaking with the teacher and it opened doors for conversations and she later got to meet the mother of that child, but she didn't approach him immediately. Straightforward, we, I had become friends with his little sister, and after a few weeks, she then brought up, oh, one, of, uh, can't, one, one young boy at the school had said, if, all, if you say you're Indian, no, all Indians are dead. And it hurt her, and she goes, who would say that? And my mom goes, oh, your son. <laughs> it was very casual, and she's like, okay, we need to work on this. And so, I have a couple things to share, and as you took note, I brought my notebook up because I have been focused on revitalizing the language of my ancestors, which happens to be the Mutsun language. There are, I believe, eight 
in Ohlone territory, sorry, <laughs> eight, and I happen to reside in Indian Canyon, which is Mootsin territory, and that's South Santa Clara, North Monterey Bay, and Gilbert Hollister, right where Indian Canyon is, and I was lucky enough to, one, get to know Vincent, and two, he helped open the door for me to participate in the Breath of Life uh, language survival with uh, Berkeley and Akles, uh, advocates for Ameri indigenous California language survival, yeah, acronym. And so with that, I got to meet a cousin, Karina Luna, and she's been working with Natasha Warner on a dictionary for the Mutsun language, and I'm so lucky that I came in right around the time where they are establishing a strong word base, and also with all the notes, Harrington notes, De La Cuesta notes, all of that information that has been documented and sadly has been very dormant. If anyone ever tells you California languages are dead, just tell them that they're dormant and they are being awakened. And so I've been lucky enough to work with them. I've actually produced a coloring book for Indian Canyon that soon will be publicly, well, right now it's publicly available, but I mean published um, and shared with a few establishments, but I'm sharing it in classrooms already, and I'm selling it to families and friends and gifting it to my elders and relations. And so I'm going to start off with the very first thing I wanted to learn and it's going to take me a second, I haven't been practicing. <clears throat> and this is Mutsun Ohlone. Ursentka, mm, Ursentka atia kutis Mutsun rich kamse enohek eliakpu kansire pa champika kan wut kamse heliakempika kan amakamse kan nape piretakawas Mutsun murkurma Tom Sanak Kanis Wutu. And it is saying, I only learned a little bit of the Mutsun language, but my heart is happy. Well, technically, it's my liver is happy because that is the seed of all emotion. And <laughs> I enlighten my relatives. I make my people happy. I am of this land, a Mutsun woman. Thank you, all my relations. <laughs> oh. So I was so excited to be able to say that. And the challenging part, with the Mutsun language, thankfully it's one of the most documented of the, uh, what is the, I'm losing the word, the language branch, like the group that we're, Panushan, thank you. Because <laughs> I was reading one where it says Utien, and I'm like, okay, Utien, and then Panushan, sorry. And so it's one of the more documented ones, and we share a lot with Chichenyo, even though Chichenyo is way up here and Mutsun is right down here. And when I was speaking with one of the linguists, she was really focused on the language. And Native people are a little more spiritual and sacred, so I wanted to say something to, to honor my elders and my ancestors and spirit and ceremony. And she goes, for us linguists, we don't focus on the abstract. <laughs> I'm like, that's not abstract. But for linguist definition, it's for abstract. And so she focused a lot on the, you know, this is this and that is that, which is great because there's a lot of information out there. So fundamentally, we're able to say, like, the dog's just running and this is going on and I'm sharing this with this person. But it's kind of harder to say, like, well, of course, like, my heart is happy, so seed of my liver is happy. And different things like honor my elders or, or, or my relatives. But we have words for relatives, but we don't have words for elders who have passed on. So I either have to say my dead grandmother, my dead grandfather, my dead this. So I have to say just I make my relatives happy. And then I would say alive and dead. So I'm learning, and I actually, I'm always frustrated with the English language because it's so ambiguous, it's frustrating, words change, letters change, and also the sounds of them. There's nothing consistent. And with our language, it's simplified and it's constant the way the constant vowels and consonant goes there's always a consistent pattern so it never changes it never confuses you never slips you up and i'm like something i could understand now i just have to relearn it but it's awakening within me and being the daughter of Anne marie Sayers and being one of the only lineal descendants residing on this sovereign land there's a lot of responsibilities with this the roots that i have and the steps that i walk forward in and with that, my mom would want me to share with you a song. I honor all of my ancestors. I am Kostanoan Ohlone and Chumash. 
I'm actually comprised of many California natives as I'm doing my genealogy a bit deeper. I have so many California natives, but dominantly right here in the Bay Area. And then a little bit of Chumash and with the Chumash roots that I'm trying to honor, I want to share with you my grandmother's song. This song came to me differently than, than it was taught. And so just out of respect for my elders who have taught me that song, this one is a little different. And with this song, we honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and in all Mother Earth, for without them and without her, we would not be here. We are sharing this time and space together for a reason. And so with this song, that's where those energies lie. And yeah, I'll scoot this over this way so I can be forward. My, my, And so I just wanted to share those pieces. I have one other song that I've shared and heard in many languages, so I'm not sure what origin it has. But we have a connection to the land because we are Bay Area Native peoples, and Native peoples of all nations have that connection. Some of us who are uprooted, we are wanderers, and we are kind of like blowing in the wind, and we find connections with our relations and our family and friends. But for me, I identify very rooted in the Bay Area. As much as I do want to travel, I know I'm coming back. I know I'm going to be right there in Indian Canyon in the log cabin welcoming people to Ohlone territory and being an advocate for truth and history. I am always continuing my education and striving to teach more people about the truth. I was just at um, East Bay, East Oakland Boxing Association, but that boxing association has turned into an awesome after-school youth program. And I got to talk to them and talk to them about the clapper stick, or traditionally we call it a slap stick, elderberry, talking about our indigenous foods, talking about the missions, talking about a little bit of the origin of Thanksgiving, though I don't have a lot of information about the Wampanoag and everything that happened. I just generally am being an ad advocate as it's not all hunky-dory and fluffy as <laughs> it's being presented in schools. And so Native people do have that connection to the earth. And so there's a song that my mom has always taught me and shared with me. And um, I'll sing it in English afterwards so you can recognize it. Pide kanama si kampation hetel kanoso so to kanoso. Pide kanama si kampation Earth my body, water my blood, air my breath and fire my spirit. Earth my body, water my blood, air my breath and fire my spirit. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Canyon. Um, Canyon and I, we've developed this really great friendship that I, I very much have a lot of respect for. And, and I think that we have an obligation as indigenous people to support one another and to support the good works that each other do. And a few years ago, when um, 
when Canyon was just starting um, to re reawaken her moots and words, I, um, I, I, I'm just, I'm just, you know, amazed by how far you come and and how how far you've come with pronunciation and and you know it just is a testament to what is possible when our hearts and our minds are in a good place and um and besides that she's just a really good friend too she's a good person so <laughs> that's always nice <laughs> um since canyon was singing a song in shumash we um we have another person who's in the audience, who's Shumash as well, Carly Dominguez. And if you're comfortable, I would be honored, we would all be honored if you could share some of your words. And the Shumash are our relatives down south in the Santa Barbara area. Thank you, Carly. Hakuachu. Hello, my name is Carly Dominguez. Um, I just want to say, I guess I'll say a few of the words that I know in Chumash. They're mostly place names from where I'm from, which is the coast between San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara. So um, the words that are coming to me now would be Cayucas, Pismo, Sepcato. Um, wow, what are some of the other ones? Mm -hmm. Sea is actually water. I have yet to study my language, honestly. So what I know are mostly place names, like I said. And um, where I've spent my time studying, actually, for the past few years has been with our plants. So I know um, the name of our four sacred plants, and I'm happy to share them here with you today, because they are the words that I know. Um, and so maybe, actually, I was thinking, as I say them, I'll say them in Shumash, and then I'll say them in English. And if you can kind of like imagine them, if you know the plants, you can kind of see them. I don't have them with me, so I'm hoping that you can maybe know. So we shop is Yerba Santa. It's a long green leaf, and it grows like kind of like this, and it has purple flowers that attract um, butterflies. So that's we shop. And then we have mulash, which is mugwort. It's um, a larger plant. It grows like that. Um, yeah, and that plant, um, that's for our dreams. So I just hope that you'll remember that when you see that plant, that that plant is for your dreams to come true. Um, and then so then we have uh, Kopshik, which is coastal sage. Um, and the coastal sage is this like minty, like this light tur like turquoisey minty plant that kind of grows out like a bush. And that's for pleasant memories. So that gives you a little bit of the insight into to how we think about, you know, the plants. Like, we're concerned with dreams and pleasant memories. And then um, white sage, of course, is we shop in Shumash. So um, white sage is a um, white <laughs> sage that grows up. Comes out like this. And that's to keep the bad things away and the good things close. And I hope with just those few words, you can know a little bit about my people and how we see the world. You know, that's we're more concerned about our dreams and um, coming true. And that's something that was instilled to me by my family. I'm glad, um, I think Vince, you mentioned um, like sort of our grandparents that don't necessarily know the language, but they know how to be Indian, right? So um, my grandmother, I was raised in, in the homeland of my father. And um, yeah, so my, my grandmother um, was always making sure that we told her what we did every week, what our plans were, what our goals were, and how we were going to achieve these goals, OK? And I didn't realize growing up how special that was being a native person. I didn't realize how important it was to have weekly counsel with somebody that believed in me and believed in my dreams and believed in my success because, because a lot of people that I interacted with at school or um, any place that I went, they couldn't, they didn't have those same like goals for me necessarily, you know. And this is something I've learned growing up. I didn't know that when I was in public schools, right? It's just something I've learned later that 
Um, so I just want to say that. And I also had the privilege of being raised by um, 10 uncles and aunts also. And none of these people spoke the language, right? None of them knew the language. But we knew the places on the land to go to. We knew which pine trees we to go to which that were important. We knew which waterfalls were to go to that was important. We knew when it was time to go to the ocean. We knew that we had to go to the ocean so that we could um, start again. I think my family knew that we had to process traumas, and my family didn't talk about the traumas all that much, but we would just go and take care of it. We would go to the ocean and let the ocean clean it away. I, I'm from the ocean. Our creation stories are from the ocean. Um, yeah, so <laughs> they taught me how to be Indian, even though I didn't necessarily know the language. And as I've learned some of the songs, I've learned songs about dolphins and seaweed. And so the ocean is very, very present in our language. And it explains a lot to me about who I am. Um, the ocean is an extremely important thing to me. And it's not something that we see in movies. It's not, if you're in American culture, it's just not as present as it is for me and for, um, for my people. So um, that's, I think that's, what I needed to share with you all this evening about the Chumash people of the West Coast. Um, we are a coastal people, we are happy people, and um, yeah, I'm very grateful to, to be here with you all today. I'm very, very happy that um, my relatives from the North are welcoming me. I, I moved out of my homeland um, when I was 18, actually, so I, I was sheltered. I, I was raised with my family and then moved out, and. Since I've been up here, it, it's been great meeting all these people because I grew up, for all intents and purposes, with only Shumash people, which were my family. <laughs> but I didn't know how special that was until I like got out of it, right? And it was like, oh, not all people grow up with like coastal California natives. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so um, since then, I've been reaching out and getting to know um, the Amamutsan people, Ramsan Ohlone, Chichenyo, all these people of the the Miwok, coastal Miwok, Pomo, all these one. Kur the Yura, Kuruk up north, Kuruk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all these wonderful people that have different stories from um, my my family story. So, thank you very much for being here and sharing this space with me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so powerful, I think, to see how our stories, even if they're different, how they overlap. And as Carly um, was talking, um, I was realizing that our languages are from entirely different families, Chumash and, and Ohlone languages. But when she was talking, your word for water, she said a C, is our word for water in Chochenyo, and also in Mutsin, and also in Ramsin. So there's similarities that are there. And when I'm looking around and I'm looking at a lot of the California native people who are here, which um, I'm looking at our jewelry and we're like the original like bling bling people, I think, you know that? <laughs> like, and in Chochenyo, um, or for Chochenyos, for Ohlone's, the stories that I was taught, and I can't speak for everybody because we're all different. We're all not just one group of people, but there's a lot of different Ohlone's and different tribal groups, and, but my grandmother would tell me that we wear abalone because for us it protects us and it gives us protection because you see how shiny it is and how beautiful it is, but when there's bad things at the world that are thrown at us, the abalone reflects the, the, um, those bad things away from us and gives us protection. So I see a lot of people in my family, especially the elders, like my grandma, and um, some of my aunties, and they won't leave the house without wearing a piece of abalone, even if it's like a small thing, like a, like an earring or a bracelet. And when I'm looking around, I just see like how that's still true even today. The other thing that I wanted to mention um, is that since this is like a yeah, spoken word event, um, at Heyday Books, where I work, because uh, I work for News for Native California as well as doing a lot of other things, because Native people in California, all Native people, we all we gotta wear a lot of hats, you know? We, we gotta like always do, whether it be language revival or protecting sacred sites or protecting our music or songs or whatever, we're always trying to like do a million things at once and we're usually pretty successful at it. But when I was, um, 
when I was at having this first spoken word at Heyday Books in Berkeley, we had this wonderful, beautiful event where we strung lights throughout our, our old office, which used to be like a violin factory. And we strung like Christmas lights all throughout the parking lot and gave people blankets to sit down. And there was a band that came and sung uh, rock in the Maidu language about the internalized oppressions that Maidu people had um, and continue to have with um, the Gold Rush genocide. And there was songs that were sung. Car Carly sang a, sang a song. Um, um, Kayla, my Hoopa friend, sang Smelly Cat in the Hoopa language. Um, there, was, there was rap that was done. There were stories that were told that brought people to tears. There was this feast of traditional California foods that were mixed with, um, with, modern, with modern foods. And Malcolm Margolin, who's my boss and the author of The Ohlone Way, and he started Heyday Books, he was telling this, this story and he said, he said, in the 20, 30 years ago, in the 1980s, he would go to these language conferences and he would see so much pain and suffering and sadness. And there was this just this overall sense, he would say, that was, that was very depressing and it could be very sad because there were people who were coming from the last generations that could have been the very last generations of their language. And with that, you could imagine there would be sadness, right? And that's rightful, that's rightful sadness. But he said, this event that occurred, the spoken word event in Heyday, it was boisterous and it was loud and it was fun and it was dynamic he said, you know what, it was even sexy. <laughs> and, and I like to think about this and think about how, you know, we're not just like these extinct people of the past, but how we're, we're living, thriving, you know, modern people of today. And one thing that Carly was saying that I tried to touch upon a little bit earlier is how even if we didn't know a lot of the specifics of our Indian identities, we knew that we are Indian, that we are indigenous, that we are native. And as long as we know that, a lot of the, the specifics can come back to us, like that song that I was singing or that sort of stuff. But there is, I wanted to end with a story. And storytelling for native people, it's very significant because it teaches us how to be good people and how to live li good lives. And it teaches us values and morals. And it kind of teaches us how to make sense of this complex world that we, that we live in. And a lot of Ohlone stories survived, and they survived different times. They survived colonization. They survived the missions. They survived the gold rush genocide. And a lot of these stories survived, but in order to survive, they adapted to different languages. So some of the stories for Ohlone's, they, adapted, they were adapted into Spanish during the mission times. Then they went to English after the Americans came in. And then for a long time, that's how a lot of these stories were told in English. And the roots of the stories, though, never really changed at all. Just the medium and the language of how those stories were told might have changed. So the story that I'm going to tell, um, I've never done this before, but um, it, I, um, it's, I'm going to tell it only in Chochenyo. Then I'll give you a synopsis of it in English. But um, at Breath of Life, the language conference that, um, that, um, that was just being spoken of, I was, I was able to translate some of these stories from my elders that were told in the Rancheria, um, where Pleasanton's at today. And they were told in the, in the Rancheria, and they were, they were recorded in the 1960s, and they were told in English for a long time. And then now, when we come together at our language classes, we tell these stories in Chochenyo again. So could you imagine how special that is to have something go from Chochenyo into Spanish, into English, and then back into Chochenyo? You know, it kind of speaks to that human capacity to heal and to become better and to fix things that were se seemingly once lost. So if I stutter at some points, um, just bear with me because I never told it strictly in Chochenyo. I've always usually had somebody translating it for me and then telling it, translating the lines into. The story goes off and it starts off. Uyakish roekne makwara ptak payanhit kanakshe. Aye payanhit kanakshe 
ya wat shekne ya ammakne makmuakma aloni im henturhi to akshikma ya wat en makruetka ya rakat halkin aye kikne payan hit kanakshe ya wat shek makwetishki em acho mayan aye ki mayan mayan ana Anna ne tuhi, Anna. Aqua hinsustek ne, ne tuhi, Anna. Hinsustek ne, hinsustek ne, Anna, mak acho, mak acho mayan. Mayan ki aqua tak chormon, yua tak chormon. Aqua tak chormon, yua tak chormon. Aye, mayan truekne, mayan truekne, ne tuhi. My antru hekne. Mayan ki, mayan ki, aitakishmak. Uksharit urakishima. Uksharit, uksharit hemmenya urakishima. Ne tohi aye ne marute. Aye hushishtak. Aitakishmak ki ana mayan. Aye mayan ki, mayan ki akwetakin sustekne. Akwe takin sustekne, tuekne ne tuhi. E takishmak ki. Ok. <laughs> Mayan ki aruki shikma, tara shikma. Aye ki. What is ye pote wish enen? What is ye pote wish? Ne tuhi, ne marute. Aye ne pote wish enen. Ya rute mak you. Mayan ki e takishma kurakishima. Kurakishima uksharit pamun. Pamun ne tuhi, ne marute, ne tuhi, ne marute. Kurakishima pamun. Aye ne e takishma ki. Ok, why not? What is shek? <laughs> ne tuhi, mayan, mayan uksharekma. Pamon, pote wish, aye tarashikma, pote wish enen. Enutka, ya waten, alkin, makruekma. Aye, payan hit kanakshe, hikne, hitikne, ne urakishima, ya waten, halkin tak. Aye, payan hit kanakshe, waka aye rocket palup, rocket palup. Rocket palup, aqua tahin nu shikma. Aye, payan hit kanakshe amakne. Ne urakishima pamun patuish. Nom, 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 nom. Aye, payan hit kanakshe amakne. Imhen urakish, utin urakish, kapan urakish, urakish, urakish. Urakishima potuish enen. Aye amakne, amakne. Aye payan hit kanakshe hen web wetel. Aye wetel, aye wetel, aye wetel. Imhen tuhi payan hit kanakshe akokne makruetka. Makruetka inutka halkin tak. Aye, mak muak ma kikne. Ah! Payan hit kanakshe anna, anna watishek ne mak muak ma. Ne tuhi makruetka, anna. Aye, payan hit kanakshe watishek ne makruetka. Mayan kikne, yu watam chormon. Kanak truek ne, ne tuhi. Aye, mak muak ne shawe. Ne shawe, ne shawe, ne shawe. You are, you are, you are chamun. You are, you are, you are chamun. You are, you are chamun. Tak ne tuhi. You are, you are, you are chamun. You are, you are, you are chamun. You are, you are, you are chamun. You are, you are, you are 
watch a moon talk, you are, you are, you watch a moon. I have pion hit can actually kick me. You are damn John Moon, can act to wreck me. Pion hit can actually what the shake name after wait car. I hit tick me, mark two can talk. I a cock ne, ne yanu, tarute mark two can talk. I am a Muakma, Yarute, Yarute Maktukuntak. I a Payan Hikanakshe, Chachapu, I a Chachapu, I a Chachapu, Maktukuntak. I a Nessa Payan Hikanakshe, Yarutek me, Papa, 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 Papa. I a Henweb Erkishima Homoshikima. Erkishima homoshikima, Yarute makurinihimu, Yarute makarak, Aye mayan kekne. Nesa Yatish payan hit kenakshe, Tachachapu em ishu. Aye makmuek ma chachapu, em ishu kma. Aye nesa payan hit kenakshe, Akwetak, Yarute makwareptak, Netuhi. The end. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so, the language, so a little bit of our story, just a synopsis. A long time ago, there was this evil creature, this evil, evil, evil creature called the blood monster that loved to eat the blood of Ohlone people. That was its favorite food. Yes, it was. So he would go around to all these different villages and he would eat the blood of Ohlone people. And you know what happens after he ate the blood, they would die. So, you know, things weren't looking too bright. Things were kind of grim at that time. And then one day, because before we had Facebook and email and all this stuff, you know, we had runners who would spread messages and they ran to this big Ohlone village. And they came to this village and they told the, the Kapitan, the, the headman, the Wetish, they told the headman, Payan is on, um, on his way. The bl that means blood monster. So, um, the, the Kapitan, the headman, he asked Coyote, his best friend, what do I do? Do we run away? Do we go relocate somewhere in the hills? Or do we just, do we just give up? What do I do? So Coyote said, don't worry, I'll make a plan. So he went and he asked a bunch of ladies in the village. He said, I need you to make lots and lots and lots of acorn soup. And the ladies said, why? We have enough acorns. Well, you know, and all everybody's eating right now, so why should we make more? And then they said, just make sure you make it. So th they all trusted Coyote. So they said, okay, we'll go make lots of acorn soup. We trust you. It's kind of weird, but all right, why not? So then he asked other people in the village, other ladies. Um, he said, we need you to make lots and lots and lots of baskets, those beautiful watertight baskets that people use to eat soup out of. Because we're so smart, we know how to make baskets that are tight enough to hold water. Remember that. So we made. So um, the ladies said, "But that's a lot of work." And they said, "Just please make these baskets. I need you to make them." So the lady said, "Okay." So they made lots and lots and lots of watertight baskets, soup baskets. Then Coyote went and asked a bunch of the guys to go into the mines and collect this red mineral that we called ochre, that we used to uh, make body paint out of and to make red paint as well. So the guy said, we're tired, and those mines are far away. But Coyote said, please, I need you to do it. So th they said, okay, we'll go. We trust you. You're our friend. So they went, and they collected lots of red ochre to make, to make red dye. So then once Coyote had all of these things, the acorn soup and the red dye and the watertight baskets, he mixed them all together. And he added all these baskets to make it look like there was fake blood. And Blood Monster began to see this fake blood concoction. And Blood Monster's evil, but he's also pretty stupid. So he started to eat. And he saw these baskets, and he started, they were all leading on the trail leading to the main village called Halkeem. And they started to eat. And they started to eat, and he, well, he started to eat. And as he started to eat, he got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. 
because he's such a glutton, you know, he can't stop eating. He just keeps getting bigger. So then he makes his way to the entrance of Hawkeen village, of this big village. And the people start screaming and they say, why are you doing this to us, Coyote? Why are you leading this evil creature right to our village? What's your problem? Why are you doing this? Are you crazy? And then that's when the blood monster was making his way. And Coyote said, don't worry, I have a plan. And then Coyote said to all the people, go into the center of the roundhouse that's in the center of the village. And everybody go in that roundhouse, make your way there. And then as they were going to the roundhouse, that's when Coyote started to sing to them with his, he pulled out his clapper and he was singing. And the song kind of translates to, don't be scared, don't be scared, don't run away, don't be scared. So he makes his way, so all the people get into the center of the roundhouse. And Blood Monster at this point, he's massive. He's like this big, heavy, f you know, fat thing that's like trying to make his way into the center of the roundhouse. And Coyote places the largest basket of this fake acorn soup blood concoction in the center of the roundhouse where all the people are at. And so Blood Monster tries to push his way into that roundhouse to get that very last basket of acorn soup. And he tries to push his way and push his way, he pushes his way and he pushes his way. But what he didn't realize was that Coyote lined the doorway of this roundhouse with needles and arrowheads and obsidian points and thorns. And so when he pushed that final push into the roundhouse, he popped, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> and he turned, so the story goes, he turned into a thousand mosquitoes. <laughs> so then when he turned into all these mosquitoes, then Coyote said to the people, now you can defeat him. Little by little, when he lands on you, because he's still this hungry thing, you know, he's still trying to eat their blood. He said, um, cha chapu in Ishu. So slap your hand. And and then little by little, they defeated the blood monster. And then through that, he never existed again in the world, except when there was a mosquito around. <laughs> so he still made his way. And the moral of the story that was passed down to me from my elders is a couple of things. First thing is you trust the people that you love and you trust those people who, who've never let you down. That's, a, uh, that's one value that we have in our community is trust. We trust each other, especially the people who are good to you. The second thing is you don't run away from your problems. You tackle your problems head on and you don't run away. You don't act cowardly. You, 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 face, you face your fears, you face your problems. And the third thing that was passed down is that if you have a huge problem, like the blood monster, or the, the way that my grandmother told it to me when I was a kid, she said, if you have a huge homework assignment, a huge essay, you know, something like that, and if you try to tackle it at the very last minute, you likely won't succeed if you try to tackle it like in its immensity and its fullness. But if you break it down little by little, piece by piece, just like how a blood monster was defeated by the mosquitoes, then you'll likely succeed and you'll, and you'll do well. And that's a value that we have in our community that I still see us have for Ohlone's is the value of moderation. And so moderation, trust, and not being afraid to face our problems are things that are connected to this story. And now it's so special to be able to tell this story in Chochenyo because we couldn't have done it 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but now we can. So I think this is the end of our time together at um, the Spoken Word event. If For the people who are native to California, um, can you please come to the stage? The California native people, indigenous Californians, whether Ohlone, Chumash, whatever. And if there's some people I didn't acknowledge here, I'm sorry. The way that we say, I'll wait for Greg to come up.
big screen. The way that we say thank you in Chochenya, which is so beautiful, because when I was going through a lot of the old notes, I couldn't find a word for thank you. And I realized we didn't have a word for thank you because our concept is entirely different. And what we say is we say, which means my heart is good. But if you take the word hinnan even a step further, hinnan, it means heart, voice, spirit, soul, and life force all in one. So basically everything that makes a person whole. So we say kisorshe akinnan. Did you want to say anything? Did you can you all say that? Kisorshe <laughs> akinnan. There we go. Now you can say you know a Chochenyo phrase. All right. <laughs> Did you want to say anything? With indigenous languages, depending on who you talk to and how they've learned it, especially when you learn with linguists, sometimes they take the focus on the exact definition. And there's a word that my grandmother has always shared with my mom, no son. And her and my family's understanding and definition is in breath, so it is in spirit. And then also the conversations with linguists is breath, soul, spirit. That's why in that song, in the Earth My Body song is Soto Canoso. And that would be Fire is My Spirit. No so um Peter Kanamasi Kamadian Hetel Canoso, Soto Canoso. Hetel is air my breath, so breath, and then fire my spirit. Spirit is no so. But no son in breath so it is in spirit. And I just wanted to share I do have a few coloring books on me if any were interested. So and the song is right in there, so you can actually read the Earth My Body song. So I just wanted to let you know I um, have some and sharing. So thank you. <laughs> um, just I wish you safe travels home. Thank you for being here. We didn't have much of a chance to maybe do a Q&A. Uh, one of the questions I get it, um, is, why do we do it? Why do we learn languages? Why, why does it matter now? Um, and in the 10 seconds I have, I'm not going to be able to answer that. If I had 30 hours, I probably still couldn't, because uh, it's taken me 25 years to kind of come to an understanding based on working with elders and understanding elders. Uh, we are so intimately connected to where we are. And we came from that place. And the way we communicate with it was this language. And it's unique. There are certain concepts that don't translate. So we actually lose a part of our life when we don't use our language, don't utilize that language, when we talk, go back home and talk to our homelands, to talk to the mountains that gave birth to us, the, the trees and the bushes. So it's not just intellectual, it's not just fun and games, it's not just a, a cultural practice. It defines and continues who we are. So that link to who we were for 15,000 years is something that still defines us. And even though it was asleep, it was still here. And it continues to be here, and now we can hear uh, young people uh, have finally woken up and they're shouting it. So thank you for being here. Okay, safe travels to everybody back home and thank you for joining us tonight.